Hello, and welcome to the Bearded Dentist. Today we will be doing some very difficult anterior crown preps on 6, 7, and 8. This patient has a severe amount of acid erosion on the backs of all of her anterior teeth. The lower incisors are very intimately pressed up against the backs of these teeth when she's in full occlusion, making this an extremely difficult uh, series of crown preps. The reason it's so difficult when that happens is that we need to remove enough structure off of the tooth to then replace that structure with crown material. Um, in this case we will be using a zirconia crown. Now those of you that are familiar with zirconia and patients that have a lot of wear and attrition may be saying well Zirconia will completely demolish the lower teeth as she grinds against them because zirconia is extremely hard compared to tooth structure. And this is true. However, the lab has been... We have requested that the lab hand polish these instead of glazing. If you take the time to, and it's a very meticulous process, to hand polish to a glass finish zirconia, then the polish is so such that the teeth actually do not wear against them. This comes with a further cost from the lab, but it is the right thing to do and overall better for the patient. The reason we are using zirconia is that I cannot get enough um, structure removed in order to place something like an Emax or a lithium silicate. So zirconia is the strongest and best option. She also has a little bit of what looks to be tetracycline staining. That's that grayish band in the middle of the teeth. You'll see it a little bit more as we remove more structure. And zirconia is going to kind of opaque that out a little bit. Um, it's going to be a little bit better at blocking that out. The reason we're doing these crowns is, like I said, the backs of them have been completely worn away with acid erosion. Um, this patient s suffers from GERD. Um, or so... And it, like I said, a very intimate bite. Um, so we're doing this to protect the teeth, also give them a little bit more structure, um, a little bit more structural integrity so that they don't snap and break in the future. Also, she has um, gaps in between all of her teeth and she does not like how long they are. You can see these are pretty, pretty long teeth. So we can completely change the shape, shade, and uh, size of these teeth with full full crowns. What I'm doing now is removing the interproximal areas of the teeth. We're only doing these three teeth right now. So what we're going to do is we have instructed the lab to create the teeth and we do a smile design with the lab that the patient approves of. So they're going to give us the three crowns for these teeth and they're also going to give us a putty matrix for the other three that we will prep on the day of delivery of these three. And what that will do is we'll be able to build the temps to the same shape and uh, size and dimensions of the three crowns that we put in. So that the day that she leaves, she's going to know what her smile will look like when we're completely done. We've also instructed the lab to open her bite about a half a millimeter on her molars. If you open up the bite a half a millimeter on the molars, that will translate to about a millimeter and a half opening in most cases. However, the way this patient bites is such that if we open her up about a half a millimeter on the back, she'll only really open up about a millimeter on the front. And when doing that, it's very important that you take into account the fact that you're going to be changing this person's bite. This person's had this bite for decades and decades and they're very comfortable with their bite. That's another reason we're going to be making the temps. Here you can see the backs of these teeth, how worn down they are. Uh, you can kind of get a really good picture of that here. Um, and again, I just am working with this camera for, this is now my second time using it, and it is so, the focus depth of this camera is such that even if I move one or two teeth back, it's kind of out of focus, so you will notice that. Uh, I will take that into account in later videos, but 
when we're doing something like this, um, you know, the patient's not really excited to be there, and it's a long appointment for them, so I really didn't want to sit and fiddle with making sure that we were in focus every single time. Also, I don't like touching my loops when my gloves are dirty. So there will be some, some parts of this that are out of focus. In later videos, I'll, I'll pretty much try to just stick to one tooth or one area so that I can always remain in focus. Um, anyways, when you're opening up a patient's bite, it's really important that you do it with as many teeth as possible. Uh, so we're going to be opening up the front six, the anterior. Her lower anteriors actually look perfect, and there's really nothing wrong with them, so we're not going to touch them at all. So what we'll be doing is her back molars all are acid eroded as well. So once we build up the anterior six, we will prep all eight back molars and build those up to the new occlusion that she's going to have. We're going to leave the premolars alone because I have found that if we open up about a half a millimeter, the premolars will settle into that occlusion typically within usually a few months. They'll just kind of come down and settle into where they should be. If they don't, we'll probably do some form of uh, like a, an occlusal add-on with um, composite or we may crown them. But there's nothing wrong with her premolars, so I would like to leave those alone for whatever reason they were spared from all of this acid erosion that's kind of what I see with these patients usually the back molars are very eroded and the backs of the front top front teeth are very eroded this is very common presentation with patients that suffer from GERD or really bad acid reflux or purging or bulimic patients or things like that so what I'm doing here is planing these front teeth I do three planes on the uh, buckle portion or the labial portion, if you will, of my anteriors. One is the lower one third of the tooth. The next plane is going to be pretty much the second two thirds, but the third plane is, and this is something I learned from an older dentist that does a lot of cosmetic work, the third plane is just gonna be the tip of that incisal edge. And what that does is that makes sure that you're never leaving a sharp corner on the edge. You never want sharp corners in your crown preps because that will concentrate stress every time they bite. That's why if you see street curbs are always rounded because if they were sharp, they would crack and break and sharp points are very brittle and they concentrate stress. Um, we're removing some amalgam off the back of this one tooth. Uh, this would be number seven. And this is the only tooth we're going to do any kind of build up on because we're going to be removing more than we need for the actual crown prep. So we'll be filling that in with a little bit of build up material. You'll notice I'm constantly checking and rechecking the occlusion to see how much space that I have. I'm going to do that several times during this um, incessantly. You have to make sure. And you'll notice that I continue to remove more off the incisal edge and every time you remove off the incisal edge you have to round it off to make sure you don't leave sharp corners but anyways rounding off the tip of that is not only going to relieve those those stress areas but what it's going to do is it's going to give the lab just a little bit more to work with just a little bit more to make them that much more perfect and also round these corners here like you're seeing and never leave any sharp corners so that little bit that you're giving the lab is going to be just enough to make sure that you don't get show through with your prep um, because we will be using a translucent zirconia um, which is still opaque enough to like I said block out the um, tetracycline staining but we want to give them just enough there to be able to make these as perfect as possible Every move you make, every piece of tooth structure you remove has a reason, and you constantly have to be thinking about your lab tech when you're doing stuff like this. What are they going to do? Is this going to be something easy for them? Is this going to be hard for them? Another reason we have to remove enough structure off the back of the teeth is that you always want a concave palatal aspect of your crowns. If you have a convex aspect that's not natural and what that's going to do is it's not going to allow 
the, the tongue or the bottom teeth to properly sit when the patient is making S sounds or other sounds and it will give them a lisp or a whistle. So you want to make sure that you're leaving enough space so that the lab can make a concave crown which will match a natural, what a natural tooth would look like such that you can make sure the patient is not going to be left with any lisps or whistles. Um, I always do the front two teeth. Whenever I do this, I leave the canines because the canines are a good stopping point. So, you know, I'm not, the patient isn't biting funny or anything. They always have a good occlusal stop. And so I can make the other teeth fit to where the patient naturally bites. Now, like I said, we're going to be opening the patient up, but this is something that I always do no matter what. I always prep the canine last. In this case, the canines really were spared a little bit on the the, the wear and the attrition um, that the other teeth, the front four incisors really got, uh, you know, kind of messed up with. So here we are at the canine. You can see she does have some ab abfraction happening at the cervical aspect of that. Uh, her lips kind of covering that right now, but you'll see that in a moment. Um, always remove about a millimeter off the incisal of any anterior before I do anything else. Sometimes I'll remove more if the length of the crown is longer than the shaft of my burr and I can't get a very good, so you can see the length is still just a little bit more, but that's because of that abfraction. So there's no way I'm going to be able to take off enough off the incisal to account for that for the length of this burr. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring down the buccal aspect to the plane of that abfraction lesion. And I only do this if the abfraction is not too bad. If the abfraction is super deep, it's such that if I plane that buccal aspect all the way to that abfraction, I'm going to remove a significant amount of tooth structure that is not going to be good and is going to reduce the structural integrity of the crown prep. Here you can see the palatal of this tooth still has a good amount of, you know, like I said, it didn't really get worn down. You can see those premolars look pretty okay as well. They didn't, they didn't really get hit with the, the acid erosion or the attrition. Um, the canines not as important to have a very convex or concave, excuse me, palatal aspect, but you still want a little bit, but they're going to look more like a triangle than they will with a nice curve um, on that palatal portion. So as you can see, it's, it's kind of hard to get that camera, you know, with the perfect, and, and right here, you can see that it's very little, we've got very little opening there between the two um, clearance, I should say. So we're going to remove the distal off this canine, and I go with little swipes. I go with swipes going lower and lower. That way I don't mow down the, you know, the adjacent tooth. Um, and you can see here that tetracycline staining really kind of showing through now on these teeth as we're, we're going forward. Um, so let's just see what, and apologies, very long video. It's a long procedure. It was tough to do. I edited a lot out of this, uh, a lot of me checking the bite. And anything really on the, on the palatal aspect was kind of really hard to see in my mirror. Like I said, you know, the distance takes me out of that focal range. So here I've decided that we can take off more off the canine there and that we need to. And the nice part about leaving the other three teeth, so if I was going to do all six teeth, I would do three teeth first so that I can constantly re-reference the plane of the buccal aspect with the three other natural teeth that are still there that haven't been prepped yet. And with the canines a little different, you want to go more off the premolar than off of anything else. But it's very important that you plane that buckle down. You've got a lot of space to work with on these canines. So don't be too afraid. What you don't want is two good-looking anterior crowns or incisal crowns and then a canine that's jutting out or big and bulky. That's, that's going to just ruin the aesthetics 
of everything and also it's going to make it very hard for them to keep it clean if you have a bulky cervical aspect of that crown. Here I'm planing down. This is going to be kind of like the final planing of these anterior teeth. What I'm doing is looking directly from tooth number nine or the tooth that hasn't been cut towards the other one and making sure that I don't have any points or anything sticking out. I have not done the buildup on the lingual of number seven yet. Sometimes the incisors on the top have a little divot right on the lingual aspect. Don't be afraid of this divot. Um, don't be afraid to prep into that divot. You always want to prep into the divot. The palate, the palatal gum tissue or gingival tissue is very forgiving of weird crown and um, weird crown uh, margins, if you will. Um, rarely, I, I've honestly never really seen any biological width issues or any, um, even if it is a little bit bulky or what have you on the palatal aspect, there's the, the gum tissue there really isn't bothered by it but you still want to prep into that so you can get a good margin. Here what I'm doing is I'm adjusting the lower incisors because she had a little point on the edge of that one there that was jutting up just enough to kind of mess with what I'm trying to do. And it wasn't even, so we were able to kind of flatten those out and give her a nice straight even appearance on those. And as you can see right there, it's giving me just enough, just enough that I need to be able to get that clearance for the lab. Um, again, excuse the, what should I say, excuse the uh, the blurriness here, but as you can see, just moving a little bit puts it back into focus. That's how short the focal range is. This is a 5X zoom on this camera. Um, so here I am removing a little bit more out of there, making sure that that divot on that uh, lateral incisor is, is looking good. Don't be afraid to hit the gum tissue. You know, you see a lot of these videos, these guys and they're perfect, or, you know, these dentists that don't, they, they boast about how they never touch the gum tissue. The gum tissue is going to be fine. It's going to grow back. What you don't want to do is remove the papilla and if you do have to remove some papilla, because sometimes it, it you know, hyper, or, uh, hyperplasia occurs, you want to make sure you still leave the shape of that papilla. Anyways, thank you guys for watching for my long video. If you're still here, there will be more to come. And uh, I really appreciate everyone that's liked and subscribed. If you like what you saw, please like and subscribe. If you don't like what you saw, comment and tell me why. Thank you very much. Have a great day.